Good afternoon and welcome to the Traffic Logics webinar on Tools for Traffic Common Toolbox, presented by Tim Harps. It is our pleasure to have you participate in this educational session and we look forward to hearing your feedback in our post-presentation survey. Allow me to introduce myself. I am James Weatherall and I am VP of Sales here at Traffic Logics. I've had the luxury of working for this company for almost 10 years and this will be our third webinar we have hosted with plans for many more. To give you a quick background on who we are, Traffic Logics, we're a leading manufacturer in the traffic calming industry with an ever-growing family of products including modular vertical deflectors, radar feedback signs, and the new Safe Pace cloud system. A few quick housekeeping announcements before we get started. If for some reason you do get logged off, turn simply follow the same link and it will bring you right back to the live webinar. In order to keep the flow of the presentation going, we will answer questions at the end of the webinar. If there's an overwhelming amount of questions, we will answer a select number and then email out the balance of the entire list to the entire list of attendees. On the right side of your screen, you will see an option to submit questions throughout the presentation. Please do not wait until the end, of the, to, until the end to submit these questions as we will have someone compile a list as they come in. For your reference, the webinar will be posted on our website later this week, including the PowerPoint. Please allow me to introduce our presenter this afternoon, Mr. Tim Harps. I have known Tim for several years, and not only is he a well-respected expert in his field, but he is also an incredible educator. Tim served as Salt Lake City Transportation Director for 25 years, and is a professional engineer and a certified professional traffic operations engineer. He earned these accolades obtaining a Bachelor of Science from Penn State and Master's in Civil Engineering specializing in transportation and traffic engineering from Virginia Tech. Tim was also the former chairman of the Utah Engineers Council and international president of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. He currently sits on the board of directors of the Professional Transportation Certification Board, offering certifications in, transport, sorry, in traffic operations and transportation planning. He also teaches at the University of Utah and Northwestern. And with that, I introduce you and hand over the microphone to Mr. Tim Harps. Thank you, James, and hello, everyone. Let's jump right in and talk traffic calming. Today we'll talk about why we do traffic calming and present these tools for your traffic calming toolbox. We'll discuss their uses and their positive and negative attributes. Traffic Logics will be presenting part two of this traffic calming webinar on Tuesday, February 16th, when we will discuss these other traffic calming tools. The realm of traffic calming is now so large it is difficult to cover them all in a single webinar. So mark your calendars and expect to see an invitation from Traffic Logics as we get closer, February 16th. So why do we do traffic calming? Well, it's important to respond to neighborhood residents and political leaders' traffic calming concerns. These are social, personal safety, and quality of life issues. And if we don't respond, some residents will take their own actions such as this. No one wants to see illegal or unsafe traffic controls and transportation professionals shouldn't use traffic controls inappropriately such as the unjustified use of stop signs for speed control which can lead to unnecessary or unexpected consequences such as sign proliferation which does not look good aesthetically, but also adds to costs, maintenance, and can lead to dangerous non-compliance by drivers. So let's not use tools inappropriately, but rather use the right tools for the right situation. At the same time, we must recognize that transportation professionals can't account for driver error or other actions that are just not within our control. That said, let's discuss some of these traffic calming tools. Some you will recognize as commonly used, while others may be new to you and help you think outside the box as you perform traffic calming. Let's also always keep in mind that no two streets are the same, even if they may look similar, and no two neighborhood residents or drivers react the same to the use of the traffic calming tools. The first traffic calming tool we'll look at, and perhaps the one most commonly requested, are speed humps, which must not be confused with speed bumps. Bumps are abrupt and 
effective in very slow speed areas such as parking lots. They should not be used on public streets. On the other hand, speed humps, such as the, this one shown, are kinder and gentler by design and allow for safe street driving speeds. Speed humps span the full width of the street and are generally anywhere from three inches high and seven feet wide at a minimum, such as the narrow hump shown here, on up to three and a half or four inches in height and about 14 feet wide as shown here. This wider design is more commonly used. The Institute of Transportation Engineers has published guidelines on speed hump dimensions and other organizations such as the American Public Works Association have also published design guidelines. I'm a big fan of testing traffic calming. Testing with rubber humps such as these offered by Traffic Logics allow you and the neighborhood to see what works. They also allow you to improve the final design and location of speed humps before investing in their permanent installation. And in warm weather areas, rubber humps can be used for permanent installations such as the one shown here. An effective spacing of speed humps is typically 300 feet to 600 feet. And if you build speed humps with the same material as the street, such as the asphalt hump and asphalt street shown here, it is important to identify their location for drivers with appropriate pavement markings and signage. On the positive side, speed humps are very effective in reducing speed, and they can help influence non-local traffic to use nearby arterial streets. On the potentially negative side, speed humps can shift traffic to other local streets, affect emergency response times, and even increase noise levels near the humps. Let's also keep in mind that law-abiding drivers must drive over them as well as speeders. Another traffic calming tool is a speed table, which is a speed hump with a flat platform in the center. Similar to speed humps, speed tables are used for speed control and can also be used as a raised crosswalk as shown here or even to raise an entire intersection. The walking area can be textured and colored to add emphasis to the existence of the crosswalk. Speed tables are typically three to four inches high in the center flat area and at least 20 feet wide to provide appropriate ramping grades similar to speed humps. Guidelines for their design are published by both the Institute of Transportation Engineers and the American Public Works Association. Rubber speed tables, such as those shown on this and the next two slides, made from interlocking pieces from Traffic Logics, allow for testing speed table sizes and locations. As with speed humps, speed tables are very effective in reducing speeding. They are also more comfortably traversed by larger vehicles. However, rubber speed tables should only be dual purposed as raised crosswalks if they are specifically manufactured for that purpose, so as to avoid a potential tripping hazard. Care should also be taken to identify their location with appropriate signing and pavement marking. Speed cushions are yet another traffic calming tool using vertical deflection of the road to slow traffic. Speed cushions are speed humps with brakes in them every six feet, which allow emergency vehicles to maintain their speed by running their tires between the cushions as shown in this photo. Speed cushions are typically made of hard rubber and installed with a two foot to three foot gap between the cushions to allow room for large vehicle tires to pass with little interference. Speed cushions, such as the ones shown here and offered by Traffic Logics, install quickly and are effective in slowing the speed of autos without interfering with the speed of large emergency vehicles when they are on an emergency run. Speed cushions are good applications on streets with bus and bicycle routes since the tires of these vehicles can be placed in the gaps between the cushions. Refuse and recycling trucks can also negotiate speed cushions 
which minimize the roughness of ride and the wear and tear on their suspensions. It is very important to install speed cushions such that the gaps between them do not influence auto drivers to deviate laterally too close to or across the street center line. Note in this application how the middle speed cushion was located directly along the center line of the street, which allows traffic traveling in opposite directions to safely negotiate the speed cushions simultaneously and within their own traffic lanes. Turning our attention to intersection treatments, installing bulb outs at intersection corners physically and visually narrow the street. They psychologically influence drivers to drive more slowly. Bulb outs also improve pedestrian safety by shortening the pedestrian crossing distance and crossing time. They allow pedestrians to be safely positioned where both drivers and pedestrians can more readily see each other. Bulb outs also help highlight the crosswalk location. Bulb outs can be used to make oddly shaped intersections operate more safely. They offer landscaping and decorative hardscape opportunities for the neighborhood. However, they can be expensive to install and may result in loss of some on-street parking. Bulb outs can also be used to narrow wide streets or streets with atypical layouts such as this street that was converted from two-way operation to one way with a dedicated bike lane. A variety of entranceway features can be installed at intersections to physically narrow the entrances to wide streets. They give the impression to drivers that they are entering a residential neighborhood and should drive slowly or even consider not entering if they aren't destined there. Entrance ways can consist of a landscaped island such as shown here, but also can be accomplished using medians and bulb outs. They can be hardscaped or landscaped and provide locations for other decorative treatments such as pillars, arches, and sculptures. As for their benefits, entrance ways can help create an aesthetic neighborhood identity, increase neighborhood property values, and in the case of center islands, improve pedestrian safety by dividing the pedestrian crossing into two shorter crossings. On the potential downside, consideration must be given to ongoing maintenance costs. Similar to intersection bulb outs, chokers are bulb outs used to narrow a street from both sides at strategic mid-block locations in order to influence driving speed. They can provide landscaping and aesthetic improvement opportunities for the neighborhood, including improving the street canopy. They can also define the on-street parking lane and, as shown in this photo, they can be used in conjunction with a raised crosswalk. The use of chokers lend themselves to testing, such as these made with flexible rubber curbing from Traffic Logics. Flex curbing can also be used for permanent installation, but aesthetics may be an issue. There is typically a small loss of on-street parking associated with choker installations, and you will want to select locations that are effective in reducing speed, but do not interfere with driveway use. Traffic calming chicanes can be created by placing curb bulb outs on alternating sides of an existing street or building curvilinear curbing along the entire length of the street to influence drivers to meander laterally back and forth as they drive down the street. This encourages slower driving. Chicanes can be tested using flexible rubber curbing, which helps identify the most effective locations to meander the street curbing as well as locations satisfactory to abutting property owners. As you can see in this photo, this existing street was retrofitted with bulb outs in locations that require drivers to slalom laterally when driving down the street. 
permanent chicanes can be constructed with pavers and or landscaping. Note how tree planting was used in this application to not only identify the existence of the bulb outs, but also help visually narrow the street and add to the street canopy. Also note how some on-street parking was lost, but the remaining parking lane is defined and protected. This slide shows how a neighborhood inexpensively and effectively created its own temporary chicane on a low volume private street. Traffic circles can be very effective traffic calming devices. They are small raised islands in the center of intersections of typically local, residential, low volume streets that force drivers to slow on the approaches in order to safely negotiate the intersection. They generally help reduce accident potential, particularly if the intersection is experiencing higher than expected right angle crashes. Traffic circles may also allow for the removal of stop sign controls or replacement of stop signs with yield signs. Traffic circles lend themselves to testing such as shown here using Traffic Logics's flexible rubber curbing and plastic plants to give observers a better idea of what might be permanently implemented. This photo shows testing a circle using flex curbing and plastic posts, which resulted in determining the final design and construction of this landscape traffic circle at the very same intersection. Here is a traffic circle constructed of flex curbing filled with concrete pavers. Note the faint chalk line around the circle showing how it was first going to be built with a larger diameter, but then a field change was made to construct a smaller diameter circle. Circles built in this manner can be adjusted fairly easily if the desired behavior isn't initially achieved. Here is a very open T intersection without a traffic circle. And then how it looks after a traffic circle was added. Although one might wonder just how effective this minimalist design really is. Constructed traffic circles can be paved or fully landscaped or have a combination of flexible curbing, pavers, artwork, or landscaping. This photo shows a very simple circle constructed with flex curbing filled with asphalt. This is a relatively inexpensive installation, especially if performed in-house using municipal crews. This photo shows a similar traffic circle, but with a raised center that could be landscaped. Note, however, the sign proliferation, and imagine how much more aesthetic it could look if it was landscaped and more creative signing was used, such as in this example. And of course, you will want to be careful to not overuse traffic circles, as can be seen in this photo. Some issues and design considerations associated with traffic circles include the adequacy of signage and pavement markings needed to direct vehicles around the circle, the potential loss of parking on the approaches to the intersection, the ability to snow plow around the circle, the opportunity for good aesthetics, consideration of including a drivable apron along the perimeter of the circle to allow long vehicles or those with trailers to track over the apron to negotiate the intersection without damaging it, and sizing the circle so as not to encourage traffic to drive too near or on top of crosswalks as vehicles go around the circle. And if all else fails, you can try some really serious traffic calming. Now this leads us into our question and answer segment of the webinar and I'll turn the time back to James. Thank you, Tim. Uh, in conclusion, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone who participated in this webinar. I would like to remind you that the presentation and the Q&A will be available on our website. We'd also like to remind you that part two of this webinar will be held on February 16th 
A short quiz will follow that presentation along with this one, allowing you to collect both your certificate and PDH credits. Thank you once again and have a pleasant day.